So the next item on the agenda for this morning is the uh, comments by our President Rick Clark. So I'm going to, I'll be chairing it, well, and then Rick will uh, have a few words for us. Rick. Well, good morning. Uh, stacking all my post-it notes and everything else. I, uh, first of all, I, again, there's some delegates that weren't here last evening, and I do want to give everyone a warm uh, welcome to the 46th Convention of the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor. Uh, part of what I'm going to be doing, and we just had a little discussion uh, here this morning, and uh, we'll be recommending to the incoming executive. Uh, historically, uh, we've been doing the introduction of the table uh, today for some reason and not on the actual opening, so uh, we will be doing that. Uh, uh, I'll be doing it this morning, uh, but uh, we're going to recommend the incoming executive that we do it on the opening session on, on the Sunday because there's uh, a lot of new delegates uh, here this time, and uh, uh, we can't take it for granted that everyone knows everyone, so uh, uh, we've listened and we will make those changes next year or next convention or the incoming executive will be. Uh, sisters and brothers, I want to uh, welcome you. As you see from the banners all around us, uh, our, our theme this year is uh, making a difference in our workplaces, communities, and our province. And it's my, uh, very, again, my very sincere pleasure um, to have the Executive Council to welcome uh, you, the delegates, to this convention. Uh, first order of business will be to introduce, and, and what I'll do is introduce uh, all of your head table, your full Executive Council, and then ask to uh, give the uh, appropriate recognition uh, when I ask them to stand to be recognized after the introduction. Or to may, maybe better if they, if they want to stand while I'm doing the introduction, then everybody will be up. Uh, first, and I, I look at, uh, uh, to, to my immediate left, is uh, our first vice president, uh, Sister Joan Jessam. Uh, our secretary treasurer, uh, Sister Ivy Shaw, uh, who is not with us. Uh, today, she or this convention, she is at the national convention and at the uh, uh, of CUPW. Uh, Sister Shaw had talked to me off and on now for last few weeks uh, on uh, on whether or not, or last few months, I'm sorry, on whether or not she would be reoffering, and uh, because uh, she tentatively uh, is uh, it may be retiring part way through the term, and didn't think it would be uh, appropriate uh, if we could. Uh, to do that part way through the term, so she is not reoffering for secretary treasurer uh, of the federation this time around. Uh, we will be given a, having an appropriate thank you for uh, for Ivy's uh, involvement and contribution. She's been on the executive council uh, for uh, 22 years, and uh, and and the treasurer I believe has been for the last eight. I think it has been so, or 10. Yeah, there'll be 10 now. So uh, she's made a major contribution, and it wasn't a decision that came easy. Uh, also, now next to, to introduce is, uh, and the officers is Brother Carl Risser, uh, who is a vice president at large, and he's from CAW. Uh, he replaced Brother Rick Garant, who was uh, 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 elected at our last convention and has since transferred back to Ontario. Carl, up you get. No need to me being the only one standing, eh? <laughs> uh, Brother Tom McNamara, uh, uh, CEP general vice president. Uh, Brother Jason McLean, uh, NSGU Vice President of Workers of Color and Aboriginal Persons. Vice President at large. What is General Vice President? Vice President at large. Right, CEP. Uh, General Vice Presidents. First, uh, the Canadian Auto Workers, Sister Sherry Meehan, and, uh, and Brother Les Holloway. Bro Brother Holloway uh, was named to replace Brother Risser uh, when he was elected to Vice President at large. Canadian Union of Public Employees, General VP, Sister Elizabeth Paris, and Sister Jackie Bramwell. Nova Scotia Government Employees Union, General VPs, Brother Donald Goss, and Sister Wendy Williams. Nova Scotia Nurses Union, Sister Janet Hazleton, and Sister Christine Van Zust. And Public Service Alliance of Canada, Brother Mike Mosichak, and Sister Colleen Hodder. Communications, Energy, and Paper Workers Union, Brother Harvey McFadden. Uh, Canadian Union of Postal Workers, Brother Gordon McDonald, uh, another of our executive members that can't be with us today. Uh, he too is at the, at the uh, National Convention of CUPW. International Brotherhood of Electric Workers, Brother Brian McAkron, General Vice President. 
United Food and Commercial Workers, Brother Keith Northrup, uh, also, but not away, but he's on disability and couldn't attend the convention. Service Employees International Union, uh, Loretta, Sister Loretta Melanson, and uh, she, they acquired this new position uh, since the last convention because they've uh, achieved a membership over 1,000. Uh, general Vice Presidents representing unions with memberships under 1,000, there are two. Uh, both of them are from the Bakery, Confectionery, Tobacco and Grain Millers International Union, Brother David LeBlanc and Sister Amy Payne. And representing the, uh, as a Vice President for the Nova Scotia Federation of Union uh, Retirees, Brother Larry Wark. And the Vice President represented, General Vice President representing Labor Councils, Brother Dean Tupper. Brothers and sisters, this is, oh, young workers, where, oh. <laughs> oh, Danny, we missed Danny. I was I'm going to blame that on the technical glitch someplace. <laughs> okay, uh, General, our Vice President at, lar uh, at large, Brother Danny Cavanaugh from CUPE. Yay. And the Vice President <laughs> representing the uh, soon to be, I believe, our youth committee, or young worker committee, Sister Kelly Murphy. <laughs> yeah. Jan is trying to convince us all that we could all run for that position. I said 30 or 35, only if, ID, if, if IQ counts for me. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, this is your executive, and I would appreciate you giving them the, the recognition they deserve because they commit a lot. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters, and that's well-deserving because if, when you look at the commitment, dedication, hard work that they put forward on your behalf, it's been, just been an amazing and intense two years. And in addition to what they do on behalf of, of the Federation and you, uh, they have their own respective unions and workplaces and labor councils and, and home life that they juggle as well. So, you know, the, the time that they put on behalf of the Federation certainly is well appreciated and it does make a big impact in this province because we have some excellent leadership that's out there on the issues on your behalf. The reports of the committees have been tabled and, and the activities of the Federation are, and they're both in your book. And I do want to thank the unions and the members of those committees uh, for also for supporting the Federation by, put, by allowing and putting these names forward uh, for, for all of these workers to represent you on the important issues. The Labor Council's issues, or the Labor Council, the committee's issues are issues that you adopt at convention or issues that come up uh, through executive council meetings, and they take on the, the, the interests and the challenges of the executive uh, and, and your issues uh, very vigorously and with a lot of great pra passion into it. Um, I also want to, and I, uh, they're never in the room when I'm doing this, so I, I would ask somebody to ask uh, Joan and Amy to come in because I, I do want to introduce them to the convention. There they are. It's really a great pleasure, brothers and sisters, to introduce the staff of the Federation. When you look at what comes out of that office, and if you look at the, the work that we do, and if you look at the work that the committees do, and when, when the exec, executive council meets, and putting up with me every day, I, I think they certainly well, well deserve that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, Joan's a sister in every form. <laughs> But, you, when you, but you know, when you look at everything they've done, and, and they're such a, a very humble couple, but they, well, like, we work in crisis mode. Our office is, uh, is a, we have to prioritize almost on a daily basis of what, what comes out first. 
and there's never a grumble or a gripe other than maybe out of me uh, for, for I'm the, the older grumpier one of the bunch before you say it <laughs> but they do amazing work on your behalf and 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 you know the, the clock doesn't stop when we have deadlines uh, to get issues uh, out and it certainly is uh, a wonderful place to work and I personally want to thank them for the, for their dedication support and their friendship we also have two excellent programs uh, there's reports in the uh, document or in your book uh, from the from our worker counselor program and also from our worker education slash literacy adult education program and it's my pleasure and hopefully they're here uh, but they're they one or both yeah I see Jesse ducking <laughs> Uh, we have Sister Linda Wenzel and Sister Jessie Parkinson at the back, and I would ask them to stand because most of you probably have had the ex perfect opportunity to work with them, but if not, you should. They work together so well. Not only do they share the same office now at, at, up at our, where we're housed, but they, they work so hand in glove, it's, it's just unbelievable. Uh, they continue to develop and, and, and deliver workshops throughout the province. And I, have to, I want to let you know, and as they know, uh, that both of these pro programs are of high value to this federation. Uh, we were uh, very successful, and I think this is probably the first public announcement of it, on on achieving, uh, uh, we, Jesse has done such a good job and, and, and with the help of Linda on a lot of our programs and, and with our uh, uh, temporary staff, uh, uh, Caitlin, uh, have done so well on our worker counselor program. Uh, we've, we've, under, we've been through an internal and an external review and both of which have recommended that the program continue. And we had, I think, two or three meetings with the steering committee and uh, Sister Hazelton was a part of, of that uh, process uh, when we got the recommendation had been put forward uh, to have our program, Worker Council program, continue on a more permanent basis. And we're very pleased to say that although we had to finalize the contract and do some fine uh, negotiations, like trying to get a little more money out of them, <laughs> we are uh, going to be, have a contract that's going to be renewable every five years. So our program will be continuing. And we will be advertising for another counselor and for a support person for, for that program. And uh, it's been that successful. And when you do a review of the two programs, uh, the one with the employers didn't get near the accolades. Uh, we have done everything that we should have done. We had, did not do a thing that we were not allowed to be doing. And the same can't be said of the others. But I'll let them deal with their problems and we'll, we'll bask in our glory. Uh, because they have a lot to deal with uh, and before they get their, collect or their contract signed. But again, I want to thank uh, Jesse for her hard work on that and making this achievable. It looks like we're going to have a permanent program with good staff to continue the work helping injured workers and workers uh, on, on safety issues in this province. We are also, we've done such a, a job on, on our, our Literacy Lighting the Way project uh, through Labor Councils. Uh, we are pursuing uh, trying to get additional funding so that we can continue on with that because uh, uh, providing skills opportunity and adult education opportunities and ability and knowledge uh, is crucial to where we are going in this province and as most of you know and I'll talk about shortly with the ship start here uh, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for skills upgrading and we want to be sure that our sisters and brothers in our existing workplaces have the opportunity for, for upgrading and to get uh, changes for, uh, to, to compete into this type of work. So the other uh, area that uh, uh, there's uh, others, uh, but too numerous to, to name that have uh, supported the Federation, but I do want to take a quick, and I think they're, uh, all three are in the room. You just uh, met Sister Sadaway, but I also, uh, who's the Regional Director for the Canadian Labor Congress, but also Tony Tracy, Representative and Brother Serge Landry, who has newly hired, or fairly newly hired, uh, also from the Canadian Labor Congress, and I want to thank them for all their support to the Federation, as well as the regional, uh, the staff at the regional office. So, <clears throat> so 
Sisters and brothers, before I get into the, the real body of, of, of some of my comments, I, I do want to take a moment to, uh, to thank uh, the labor movement. Uh, I had a very serious accident on April the 28th, uh, uh, day of mourning. <laughs> I, I just uh, finished at a, at a ceremony at the, uh, at the legislature and I was on my way to Bridgewater. And poor Bud apologized to me every time he seen me, but he wasn't driving the other car. <laughs> uh, just that there's a joke in that, that it seems like every time I'm going to Bridgewater for something, something else happens. But I didn't create the accident. But really what I want to talk about, two things. I, I, uh, the, the outpouring and the support from the labor movement was amazing. And not surprising, but it really was amazing. And I want to thank uh, uh, the labor movement for all of their support because it was a very difficult time. And also, and I've been doing this ever since, there's two things I've learned out of this. Uh, one of them is that I've always been a, a proud supporter of our health care system. Well, sisters and brothers, I can attest, from the roadside to home care, there's nothing better. We have got probably the best health care system. I know we got difficulties. But I received the absolute best care, good attention, strictness when I was being a jerk. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I just can't praise it enough. And our VON, uh, who are members of the Nurses Union, uh, I'm on a, a co-chair with a, a, re, a human resource person from the VON, and they had problems with their computer pay system. So every time I had a new VON, I knew the story and I made a call. <laughs> and I said, Phil, get that fixed. <laughs> because the service that I, I seriously burned none. Uh, and, and I was uh, in the hospital on the eighth floor uh, it was just wonderful. They even apologized for waking me up. All these stories I used to hear from folks. Uh, look, I, I had nothing but excellent uh, kudos uh, for our health care system and the workers that are in there. They are overworked. They need more staff. They need more support. But they don't grumble about that. They just do their job and do it well. And so to those who represent the workers that I've had the opportunity to deal with, thank you very much because it was wonderful. And the other issue, I now have an opportunity and a quest, and I've already talked with Jesse, We're going to be, and I talked to the new chair of the Workers' Compensation Board. I know the problems with a cookie-cutter approach to back-to-work legislation, <laughs> or back-to-work legislation, that's coming next, <laughs> with, with return to work when you're on workers' comp. Because the, our office had to ask, answer questions about how much weight I lifted, uh, they, they constantly wanted uh, were called me on the chronic pain issue, and so I, I know a lot of the problems, and we're going to be trying to get a meeting, uh, because Jesse and I have, have talked about it quite often. Uh, she probably thinks I moan about it quite often, but I think that we have to try to make the changes, and, and I guess maybe that's one of the benefits of, of uh, recovering out of this uh, uh, fairly quickly, is that I have a good commitment on this issue because I understand the problem. I understand the problem with physiotherapists. And what I did, because I knew the problem on physiotherapists, I, I booked it all with my own before, and I found out if they were covered by workers' comp, I booked in before they assigned me somebody. And they were somebody that they recognized, so they had to continue on with it. But there's not a lot of people able to do that, so we have to deal with that stuff. So it's, I, I, I'll pass on what Margie McDonald had said when, uh, when she found out I was on workers' comp. She said, I could just hear them in, in, down in, in, on South Street when your form came in. Oh, my God, no, Rick's on workers comp. <laughs> because I did learn a lot of the problems, and, and I've talked to them about it. Sisters and brothers, we do have rules of order that were read out to you. And these rules, generally, we follow them fairly diligently. Dili try another one. Closely. <laughs> <laughs> but... As a chair, we're generally more lenient with new delegates, and we do have new delegates here. So I would ask you to try to follow the good example of our seasoned delegates uh, in following the rules of order, but we are a little more, generally more lenient with the, 
uh, new delegates. When you look at the officers' reports, now you can see it's been a very busy time for us. With federal provincial campaigns, coalitions, rallies, meetings, presentations to government, and of course uh, elections have kept us working very hard since our last convention. And as we look back on the past two years and know we made a difference in the lives of Nova Scotian, that, that gives us great energy to face the challenges ahead. And we're up for that, up for that challenge. That's why we chose the theme that we had at, a, at an executive meeting, making a difference in our workplaces, our communities, and our province. Workers in, and their unions have been to the forefront of the fight for better health care, accessible and affordable education, housing, pensions, and a realistic minimum wage, and to improve health, human rights, all which have benefit all and enhanced our well-being and society. Yet, and I know a lot of us hear this, we occasionally hear from the right wing. It's generally in an editorial, or it's a, or a commentator on the radio, or a bank, that, the, you know, that it's, uh, questions the relevance of unions. Whether, you know, yeah, we had our time, but our unions really need it today. Well, in the past hundred years, the efforts of unions have improved standards of living and quality for all working Canadians. Unions have been fighting hard to, for gains in the workplace and for social and economic justice. Workers have gained through union membership. As Ken said yesterday, union workers make $6 more an hour than their counterparts in non-unionized workplaces. They have better benefits, vacations, paid holidays than non-union workers. And they are twice as likely to have a pension and medical and dental plans. The new realities of today's workplaces are increasing the needs of greater involvement of unions to ensure that we have the kind of workplaces and society that is important to workers and their families. Unions strive for job security, not precarious employment, safe and healthy workplaces, opportunity for lifelong learning, workplaces that are discrimination-free, inclusive, and respectful, and for better employment standards and employ the quality of life for all workers. So to those who question our relevance, we have one response. We have and know our role in society, and we aren't going away. We are and will get stronger. On that, sisters and brothers, I have to divert because Janet and Joan tested my blood pressure again this morning. The editorial in the Globe. It seems like every place I go, I start out with a news clipping. This is what we're up against. This is the rhetoric we're up against. When you get a headline, a governments don't have to surrender to public sector unions. It wasn't always that way. Canada could take back the right to strike or adopt the Wisconsin model. And he goes on. I didn't have a chance to read it all because I started blurring. He says that we could tinker with the pension plans. Well, sisters and brothers, shame on that guy indeed. Because this is what we're up against, sisters and brothers. This is what the right wing in this country are doing. This is what our, unfortunately, what our, our media prints more of. I, I'll probably talk a bit about our, our own when I talk about first contract legislation. But we have to counter this stuff because we know we make a difference. And we have to try to start getting, they won't give us the, the same editorial ability as they give the right wing. So as Ken said yesterday, and as a couple around the table attested to Tony and his Twittering, I guess I and a few others are gonna have to learn to do that because we have to make sure our messages are out because we deserve what we get. And not only is it good for our workers, our families and our communities, but it also helps bump things up for the workers that aren't organized because their employers start providing the same for them so they don't lose them to another workplace. So we have to take up this challenge and try to get our message out to counter this garbage as much as possible. We could say we could, could boycott these papers, but um, uh, today, with the right-wing slant to most of our media, we'd be reading stone tablets or Twitter. <laughs> so I think we have to really retool and, and get ready to start taking this on. Because there's a lot in our society, a lot in our communities, 
a lot, maybe even some of our own families, that really don't know our stories. And we have to find a way to make sure they understand our stories. Maybe we'll have to go on one, some of these public tours like, like our conservative, provincial conservatives are doing right now, uh, talking about the first contract legislation. We might have to start taking these tours and getting our stories out in our communities. But sisters and brothers, the, the, the big and the high point I want to take a minute to talk on is the ship start here. I was amazed I could talk today because I bit my tongue all, yet, all last evening because I wanted to talk about it. This has been probably one of the greatest amazing activities in this province. The government, and he's been criticized for it by the way, uh, had brought out, uh, well maybe back up a little bit, myself, I'm a co-chair of the Premier's Advisory Council in the Economy. And my uh, co-chair, Robert Patzel and I, after we did a presentation to the Premier, we talked about this big contract coming. And we said, you should get the government involved in this early. And they did. They established the steering committee, called, uh, and which ships start here, came out of. And there's uh, probably 70 organizations involved in that, from all walks of life, business, corporate, financial, labor, community organizations. And really what it was, and when I saw, and we're, we're trying to be upbeat on this because we still have to con sign the contracts with the federal government, but when I read Peter McKay's comments about that campaign, if you want to talk about somebody that missed the boat, fell off the train, or missed his plane is Peter McKay. Because that campaign was not necessarily, we don't think that that steering committee came to Nova Scotia and counted signs. That campaign was really was picked up by Nova Scotians at home and abroad. Because it was a Nova Scotia pride. It was something that we could do. We know we could build ships but we wanted to take pride in it. We had thousands of lawn signs, thousands of pins, and that the, the electronic messaging from Facebook to Twitter, what's some of the other ones? <laughs> <laughs> Has been amazing. That message went straight across the country. If you went on the website, you saw probably more pins elsewhere stuck on supporting this contract than we had in the Atlantic region because it was an issue of pride. So what Peter McKay did, well, we're in the back room saying we won. Now we should take the same concept and start fo focusing on other economic development issues for this province so that we can capitalize on the ship start here and make sure that we create more jobs for our young people, and bring more Nova Scotians home, Peter McKay says no. <laughs> but we're not going to let him spoil the party. Because he was taken to task. And I, it's, an art, it's a columnist that I don't normally agree with a lot, because generally she's uh, attacking the labor movement but was Marilla Stevenson. She said he was way off base. So that tells you how far right he is when she said that. <laughs> but she also pointed out in that same editorial about a comment from the Tory leader, a conservative leader, very conservative leader, Jamie Bailey. He chastised the provincial government not necessarily for the ship start here, by using the hype of that to push through labor legislation for their union friends. Now if that isn't a leech on the lifeblood of this province, I don't know what is. Because he did not have to tarnish that. We know he does not like us. We know he does not like progress in labor laws. But he didn't have to try to tarnish uh, a government on the backs of a very good news for this province that is a, is a new page for this province. We are starting on a new beginning. So we're going to try to keep the high road because we think we're going to go, do, well we know we're doing well on the ship start here 
and we think that that is going to create more. Already in this city, they're talking about doing major projects, I don't mean the convention center, I'm talking about private developers, because of this, because people are going to need homes. So things are going to move. We're already talking about how do we get it to rural Nova Scotia in small towns so they can capitalize, finding ways to capitalize on the supply chain. So we have to be upbeat on this, but if we hear that crap, challenge them. Because this is the best thing, this committee and this contract that has come to Nova Scotia in many, many, many decades. And I think there's a lot of jealousy out there. I'm going to move quickly off that as much as I'd like to talk to that uh, uh, for quite a while. But the, there is going to be lots of op opportunities. I do want to congratulate the shipyards. They did a very professional, professional job on this. <laughs> the work they put behind this just supported what we all knew, that we, best, we build the best ships in this country, and we are Canada's shipyard. And now we move on from that because it is a great start for us. Now for a little damper, you know, even with this good news, we can't stop. And one of the areas that may, we may want to be looking at is the crisis we're seeing in our pulp and paper industry. Maybe we have to try to get a focus on how we can capitalize our, uh, the, the, the intent and the good spirit of this province to find ways to deal with this. New Page is the example. New Page got us all by shock. New Page, I believe, and the union, I don't know if they, they have an opportunity, they're waiting for a phone call, they may have to head out for a meeting because there are new uh, people interested in that plant. We've been involved, Joan and I uh, went down and met with the community committees because we got a little tired of hearing Billy Joe Playing, pulling on people's heartstrings. And we went down to put the reality on it and, and suggested that the involved Labor Council as, and the unions are involved down there, and we offered anything we can do. And other than the initial outreach from us, we haven't heard a thing back from them. They want, you have to question whether they're looking for headlines or, or looking for positive results. We're committed to try to, to, and we have been working with government on trying to ensure that we get a new operator. I've been at the meetings down there where the Premier has come in and had said the way to protect those workers' pensions is to have a new owner. And we don't want a new owner who wants a garage sale. We want an operating paper mill. So, so far, and I, I, I will say, sisters and brothers, that I, when, I, when we saw the, re the response of the government to this crisis, it was heartwarming. Because in the past, and some of you are here, when we had closures, previous governments would send somebody down to help you file for your EI. I went to one meeting down there that had nine deputy ministers down there talking about retraining, talking about upgrading, talking about skills upgrading, not for someplace else, but for that facility. There you had people down there working on trying to make sure that the woods are ready that the, to, for processing so that we can, uh, when the mill starts again, it can operate. We've seen a commitment and a team that we've never seen before, and we want to see it more elsewhere. We need a lot of problems, and, and I, I think the, the area that I, I think our biggest concern is when you're a province or a small province and you're faced with a crisis like this, you're limited in what you can do. Because we got problems with trade issues that the federal government adopted. So we say that the federal government, because I think a big problem that we we're having with our, with our paper industry today is because of the globalization and because of the trade deals. When the market went south, not a good intent because that's where our jobs went as well, but when they shrink, they shrink towards their home base. And they're closing down plants in areas, and unfortunately, Canada is one of those areas that are seeing the plant, mills and plants close when, when, when they buy up the competition and close them down due to economic problems or decisions of the company. We think the federal government has got a role to support provinces. We think the federal government should be looking at, rather than uh, putting a bill forward, 
they should for a four billion dollar tax break that they're in turn going to are in turn going to give to business or to the banks they should be investing that in people they should be investing that in their own employees they should not be cutting back the, the our workplaces that we're seeing in the public sector in the federal public sector we have got a federal government right now that last convention we talked about the need of, of them to adopt a Canada pension plan or increase a Canada pension plan and strengthen EI. They got a, a majority government and one of the first things they do is start closing down offices that help EI claimants across this country and then put more of their own people on EI. We have got a serious problem brothers and sisters with this government this federal government. Our serious problem, and I, I, and I, I have to echo uh, what Brother George Eddy's view on it, we have got to take this issue on. How we're going to do it, I don't know. We got an executive council meeting, or Canadian council meeting, in two weeks' time. And the campaign committee is going to be meeting. This issue has to be challenged because he's just starting. I, if there's one person and I'm physically probably not afraid of too many. I don't know if I'm smart enough to be. This guy scares me. This guy scares me when he first came on the scene and George Bush was the president of the U.S., who I did not like. And my mother-in-law asked me what I thought about Harper. I said, if he ever gets a majority government in this country, I'll think I'll move to the States. That's when Bush was there. Because that's how bad this guy can be. He has no conscience, he has no principles, he has no scruples other than his alliance and his allegiance to the financial institutes and to the right wing. And we will not recognize Canada if we don't take a stand. He's attacking public unions with what he, and Ken talked about it yesterday, with the postal workers who were locked out. And when, they, when he legislates them back to work, Rather than mandating the Crown Corporation to go back to the bargaining table, he, he legislates them back to work and at a lower rate than the last offer on the table. If that isn't vindictive, then I don't know what it is. And it's the same as with Air Canada, a private corporation. First it was the CAW workers in, in the, with Air Canada, and now QP. And because of the legislature, the House of Commons was not in, they pulled another technical uh, loophole by referring it to the Canadian board, which took away those workers' opportunities to strike. Sisters and brothers, I think we're getting close, pushed close to the line. So I'm hoping in mid-November we're going to have a great debate with the leadership of this country. Because I think we're ready to do our part in that fight, in that struggle, and do what's necessary to make this federal government know that we are here, we do care, and we are going to make a difference because we cannot be pushed and bullied around. We fight bullying, and for some reason, we tolerate it in the political system. We have to let them know enough is enough and to start doing what's right for Canadians. <laughs> On the provincial scene, we have built a fairly good relationship, though it's been hard, with our provincial government. It's been hard for a number of reasons. Joan talked about the yesterday when, when, she, when we looked at the, uh, the issue on, on health care when, when we're gone to a, a company that is renowned for P3s, renowned for helping business get into private uh, services. And we are going to do what we can to try to make sure that that recommendation does not come out in that report. Because if it does, even though they can give us all the assurances they want that they will not adopt it, it will come in if it's in a report under an NDP government when that NDP government is no longer there. Because they will dust that off, bring it out, throw it in our face, said, your friendly government had a report that said that we could do that. It's an option, and we're going to do that. So sisters and brothers, not only this executive, not only your leadership, but all of us have to be ready 
to do what we can to ensure that we don't open that door in this province. We've had problems with them on the, on the wage increases. Well, if you want to call it wage increases, 1%. With the reduction in the civil service of 10%. And they said they threw attrition. I hate when they use the other people's arguments because attrition is still the same outcome. There's 10%, it's future layoffs is what it is. Because when I retire and you don't fill that job, that's a job not there for someone else. That's a job that our daughters and sons could stay home for. So it's important. It's important for us to keep these issues up with this government, to let them know. Yes, they are the best that we've had to deal with. And I have to be honest with you, sisters and brothers, you have no idea how nice it is to be able to change things behind the scenes. Some of it you don't see in the newspapers. But we have a chance to talk on issues. Before our only consultation was, well, that's what law amendments is for. And we are part of the process now. But we've all said, and uh, I don't know how many times since the June 9 election, it is some herd working with the government. Because it is easy to throw stones. But we can't lose sight of what our commitment is to you. And we have to try to make governments do the right thing sometimes in spite of themselves. And some of the problems, sisters and brothers, and I'm not one that suggests going in necessarily with a broadsword. But they have got people that work for them that did the same thing, did the same papers, did the same direction for the liberals and the conservatives, and they still have the same mindset. So they, they, got, they either have to retrain them or maybe look for side shuffling or something. Attrition. There's a good place for 10% re reduction through attrition. <laughs> because they are not our friends and they are not the friends of this government. There are things that have come out in the media that shouldn't have been out in the media. And we got our suspicions of where, but they're out there. And there's, there's information being piped to people on issues, on, uh, to the business community. And we don't know. But our sisters and brothers, I've said it before and I want to say it again. It's good having that working relationship. And it really is. And, we, and we're trying to strengthen it. But I don't think there's a time that we, they don't know that they're elected to govern because they want to be sure we know that. We're elected to represent workers. And we will always represent workers no matter who sets down on Hollis Street because we know who we represent. We know who's on the side of right. And if we had, it takes a while to educate these people, we will. But we will always represent workers. We're having the same fight with them on taxes, sisters and brothers, and a couple of your conventions I've been to. I was to yours in a wheelchair. <laughs> taxes. Some people here may not like what I have got to say, but taxes are not bad. Ta <laughs> taxes are not a bad thing. Because taxes provide our social services, provide our health care, provide our education, and take care of our seniors. So taxes are not bad, but we need fair taxes. When we increase the basic personal exemption, it should not go to those that are in the high, high income. They should not receive that because it's only a tax haven. We should be increasing the tax level on the wealthy. We should have an inheritance tax. And we should have no tax whatsoever for the poor. Because people that are even on the minimum wage, they're still being taxed in one fashion or the other. So we have to deal with those issues, but taxes are not bad. I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but I was at a couple of events with Danny. And their, their economist had said that if we go back to 10 years where the corporate taxes were in this country, now what, how long is it we'd have no de deficit? In 12 to 18 months, that's not increasing, is going back to where we were 10 years ago. In 12 to 18 months, there would not be a provincial or a federal deficit in this country. 
So who's getting rich off our sorrels? It's time for us to get joined with the movement of saying taxes aren't bad, install fair taxation, and get back to our old cliches of make the rich pay. Just a couple more issues. I'm getting what my wife affectionately tells me, powder burns me shoot my mouth off. <laughs> Labor legislation. I cannot believe what's going on in this province. I went before the Law Amendments Committee last fall on Bill 100. Bill 100 was a good piece of legislation. Bill 100 was a piece of legislation that combined all the tribunals. It brought all the legislation under one roof. It, changed, uh, uh, it gave successor rights to public sector workers. That's something we've enjoyed in the private sector for years and years and years. That if we change hands, and it's a hedge against if they do privatize a job. So that if they do privatize a job, then at least your union and your benefits and your pay scales and everything goes with it. And guess who spoke against it? Aside from clickety-clack group with the uh, CFIB and Luke Erkovic and a few of them. The leader of the opposition, both of them, the liberals and the conservatives spoke against that. They spoke against successor rights. They spoke about combining the legislation because it was a veiled threat on the private sector in this province. They spoke against later, the, and how the media let them talk about this, but they spoke about your pensions. This one may mean that we wouldn't be able to make changes in pension plans. And the rhetoric went on and on and on. And the government did everything they could to try to appease. And we said pass the bill because you consult it. They had their chance. The only chance we ever had was that's what law amendments are for. And they were there too. So anyway, we got that legislation through, but it hasn't stopped them. We now have first contract legislation on the table. Sisters and brothers, we made a conscious decision as a labor movement. In this very hotel, we, we pulled all the leadership together and talked about the first legislation that we wanted to go forward with. And we said first contract is a necessary tool because our Constitution and the preamble to the, to the Trade Union Act says that workers have the right to a collective agreement. But there, there's nothing there that says that they had the right to, uh, or right to join a union, but nothing on a collective agreement. So we said we need first contract because it is an end. And first contract is not utopia. You don't get the best of contracts. It's a bare bone contract. But the history and the experience in other jurisdictions, eight other provinces and the federal government have some form of first contract legislation. It's not abused. Matter of fact, there, it's, there is a lessening number of applications to go before it because what happens, the employers cannot drag out bargaining for two months, three months, six months, two years. Because we could apply to have a first contract put in place. Because they do it because they try to get the union decertified or they encourage another union to come and raid, anything so they don't have to negotiate a collective agreement. And who's supporting them? It's the greed group out there again. Oh no, it's going to kill us. It's going to be a job killer. Eight of the provinces have it. And the federal government, which means about 15% of Nova Scotians are covered by first contract now under the federal government, under the federal code. The liberals and the conservatives are out there and the leaders and Jamie Billy, Bailey's, Bailey's a good name, traveling the province, talking to whoever he can about how this government is kowtowing to the wants of the unions. unions. Sisters and brothers, this is not about unions. This is about workers. It's assuring that the worker has a right to a collective agreement in this province. <laughs> These are the same people that spoke out against the increases on minimum wage. Jamie Bailey spoke out against the increases. Everybody's going to think he's, it's hunting season I'm after Jamie. He's setting himself up. Because he's out there saying that this government should not have approved the $10 during these tough economic times. That he thinks there might be a better time to do it. Well, there is no better time, sisters and brothers, until the NDP, through a private member's bill, established this committee 
Our increases have been going up by 10 cents a year. We have gone up an average of 6.5% in the minimum wage since that committee's been formed to catch up for the, for the past wrongs of previous governments. And we're not going back. So Jamie Bailey has to realize, and I hope some of you have the opportunity to tell him, because sisters and brothers, I never did say as an individual, as the president of this federation, that we had to support a party. I think we have to be active. I think we have to be politically active. And if you don't support this government that's in now as a party and support one of the other ones, always support workers. Stand up and tell them that they're wrong. Because Jamie Bailey does not just represent Luke Erkovic or the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. I think of better terms for that acronym. <laughs> he has to represent all Nova Scotians, and there's a lot of Nova Scotians that will be in more dire straits if, if we didn't have these changes to, uh, to, to the minimum wage. We are trying to get labor standards changed so that they will stop the precarious employment in this province. And we know we're going to have troubles with, with the Conservatives and the Liberals in the House because they're playing for votes. They're playing with our lives, our livelihood, our futures for political gain. So we have to speak up in whatever party we're at because we speak up, I personally do with the party I belong to, because they're not doing the right thing all the time. And when the others don't, don't be afraid to tell them. Because it's our democratic right. We do not work for them. It's not guided democracy. It is a democratic movement. So sisters and brothers, we have to take them on. I got nine pages on health and safety. I can summarize it. We have got a lot of work to do yet in occupational health and safety. And we have got to get our own government convinced that we have to make changes. There are a lot of good things happening, so I am really going to summarize. There's a lot of good things happening that's helping to reduce accidents and injuries. But sisters and brothers, we still had 23 fatalities last year. 23, down from 32 the previous year. We still have 7,000 compensatable injuries. We have too many injuries. We have got to find ways to make a difference. We need to expand on our education and awareness. We need universal coverage of workers' compensation in this province because the employers are skirting their responsibilities. When a worker is, is not covered by workers' compensation, generally they go on welfare or EI if they have an injury. And in addition to that, and I've started taking this issue to finance briefings or consultations. Every time we go, we see the arc of health care costs, and the, everybody points it out. We said, if you have universal coverage, you're going to reduce that. Because a worker that is not covered by workers' comp, our health care system pays for that injury and treatment. So we have to stop the lobby from the right wing, from those that don't care about the workers, from those, and there's the same ones that fight against our labor laws and fight against the minimum wage increases that don't want to be covered by workers' comp. And there's only one word that justifies or brings together all their arguments, greed. And we have to start telling them if you don't stop putting the fault on your workers, then maybe you're going to lose some of your money because we may just decide to take turns not shopping at many of your places. Because there's ways that if they want to play the game, we're going to have to find a way to fight with them. But we also have to tell this government that we need more education, we need more legislation, we need more regulation to, cut, to protect workers, like indoor air quality, psychological bullying, or harassment. That's the term. And because they, they won't take that on. Bullying in the workplace is a, is a biggest problem as bullying in the schoolyards today. And the bullies in the schoolyards today you and I are going to be dealing with them in the workplace tomorrow. So sisters and brothers, we have to be vigilant and fight for change both in the legislative and the occupational health and safety in those areas. And we have to get this government to enforce. We need this government to do the same as what has done with MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. They have to partner with us and say, we are not going to stand by to see the carnage happening in workplaces 
and make it socially unacceptable to continue to see the injuries and fatalities we're seeing in our workplaces. And we need this government to embrace legislatively Bill C-45, the Michelin Bill. We need it to recognize by legislation that they are going to prosecute the employers through negligence or direct action, cause serious injury or deaths in our workplaces, then we'll start getting them to be conscious because if they had to put their ass in jail, which isn't tax deductible as compared to a fine, then they'll start thinking about health and safety rather than the bottom line when it comes to productivity. So we have to get this government to adopt this. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, I, I think I'm going to not go through the other eight pages. But I do want to uh, just touch on something that uh, Ken talked about yesterday in occupation, uh, uh, how the occupation uh, uh, from Wall Street has expanded. And Kyle talked about our group that we have new tenants over Grand Prix. And it's a wonderful group, the enthusiasm. And I had the opportunity to go over a couple times with them, but to speak uh, uh, with them on, uh, on Saturday last, I think, or a week ago Saturday. And typically, it was a news clipping that got my ire up. Because I was just going to go over and bring the greetings and support of the Federation and say, you know, that we're there for you, we'll do what we can for you, and congratulate them, which I did. But that morning, I read a statement from the Canadian Citizens Coalition, Tax Coalition, or whoever they are, Federation. Canadian. Actually, don't mind. <laughs> uh, Kevin Lacey. And his comments about these workers. Now, they're out there against precarious employment, high cost of education, affordable housing, affordable child care. Everybody has an individual issue that's crucial to them. And his comment is, those people need a reality check. My comment was, they're living the reality. They're living what's wrong in society today. I think... This guy needs a reality check. But seriously, we have got to start challenging him. Because who does he speak on behalf? He doesn't speak on behalf of the 70,000 workers this federation represents, and I guess or their families. He sure as the devil does not speak on behalf of the 99% of Canadians that are represented over at the Grand Parade. So who does he speak on behalf? That 1%. And it's that 1% that are paying his wage and he gets more airtime and media time than our Premier. So we have to start challenging him every chance we get. Not on the Premier's defense, but on our defense. Because he don't speak on our behalf. You don't come out. I pay taxes and I'm proud of paying taxes. But I don't want him having any of it. Because I think that we have got to stop the credibility or slam the credibility of these groups. Because they, they can influence too many people. And we have to counter them. So on that, sisters and brothers, I do want, and I apologize for getting emotional on some of this stuff, but no, I don't. <laughs> because these things are important. And I'm very proud of our federation and our activists and our, and our affiliates because we've taken on challenges. And we will continue to take on challenges. And I talked last night about losing a great friend, Brother Jack Layton. And I want to leave, and I know you've all seen it, but I, he... he I, you know, his strength was no clearer, I guess, than the, the, his last letter that he wrote to Canadians. But I want to write just the, the last, and it's posted everywhere, but it's, uh, my friends, love is better than anger. Hope is better than fear. Optimism is better than despair. So let us be loving, hopeful, and optimistic, and we'll change the world. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, brothers and sisters, and have a great convention. <laughs>